is going to be on the Andover tornado outbreak that occurred in Kansas and on April 26th of 1991. A violent tornado that will not be a notable here is the Oluga area, Oklahoma, F4, pictured here. That tornado was a wedge and was surprisingly had a surprisingly brief touchdown, but did devastate, obviously, the Oluga area. Of course, starting with the overview first, with a gift that is making my mouse, my laser pointer, looking like it's having a stroke, and I'm having no FPS, actually because of this GIF. How dare, how dare I put a GIF here? Anyways, there were 55 confirmed tornadoes in just 19 hours. All of the tornadoes are, all the tornadoes and their paths are seen here on the right, lower right, and all the storm reports from this event are seen here at, above that. With, some, with the, the GIF that I was mentioning that is causing some laser pointer issues. Uh, the supercells that occurred in southern Kansas, if I'm not mistaken. I'm pretty sure that it, that's what it is. But if you read ahead, shame on you. But if you haven't, uh, thank you. <laughs> I'll now read off what I have. There were five violent tornadoes produced by this outbreak, with one of them being an F5, the end over F5. A very short recap of this outbreak is that by 7 a.m., the Norman, Oklahoma NWS weather balloon had already shown a weak cap was in place, which the NWS balloon is seen, it, and its data is seen here, to the left of the tornado tracks. And the weak cap already shown here, thank you NWS for having that. And for those of you who don't know, a cap in the atmosphere is the point is is at a certain height to where thunderstorms and their growing cumulus clouds will not grow upwards anymore and will instead flatten out as they grow, which creates the anvil shape of thunderstorms. A weak cap means that with enough updraft and enough upward motion, simply, a thunderstorm or thunderstorms are able to explosively break through that cap, and that is extremely dangerous, actually. This can be anywhere from 30,000 feet to 60,000 feet in the air, this cap. And if it's lower, it, it could be weaker, but you never really know until you have a sounding like this, which is what the NWS weather balloons provide. Aside from 7 a.m., by five hours later at 12.10, a PDS tornado watch was issued. A PDS tornado watch means is a particularly dangerous situation tornado watch. So definitely more dangerous than your regular tornado watch, which already is dangerous. And by 1800, so 6 o'clock, the dry line from the cold front was already in Kansas as seen here in this left-hand image. And 21 people in total would be killed by this event. Let's get on with the notables, of course. First up is the Garber to Pawhuska, Oklahoma F4. Obviously, pictures of it are seen all around here. This had a track of 107 kilometers, not as a family and was up to 1.2 kilometers wide, which is three-fourths of a mile. This tornado would kill one people, sorry, one person, my mistake. I was looking at the injuries and thinking multiple, and would injure six people. There we go. Tornado tracers were already roaming the area at this point, because Skywarn is a thing, and spotters have also grown in numbers since the 50s. This is 1991. And among these spot, among these tracers what were ones from KGHR-TV, the news outlets for the region of Garber to Pawhuska. And these tornado tracers actually witnessed the touchdown of this tornado. And if there is a video of that, 
I cannot find it, and I desperately wish I could. <clears throat> Pardon me. Aside from that, this tornado would s scour pavement, so lift pavement off the ground, likely across this interstate here. And this little thing that I circled in pink is a vorticity noodle that is really hard to see because there's not that much contrast, but I promise you it's there. This tornado will also debork many, many trees. And this F4 status that the tornado obtained was actually very, very difficult to achieve and determine because, well not achieve, but determine because this tornado tracked rural areas for its entire life, for its entire life. And that, pr and tornado ratings, despite being shown at, by wind speed, is actually portrayed and realized by damage. A great example is the 2013 El Reno tornado, which is officially by the NWS rated an EF3, but was actually an EF5. So, you know, there's that. Now it's because only EF3 type damage was found in El Reno, which is the only notable source that damage could be found. I mean, crops are s scattered around even by EF1s, so there's no true, de there's no way to determine something like that. But pavement scouring, on the other hand, is a good indicator of a higher rating tornado. So, aside from that, the last point here about this tornado is that do mobile Doppler, or Doppler on wheels, again, also DOW, recorded winds of 268 miles per hour, or 431.3 kilometers per hour. And notability here, that wind speed is the fastest wind speed recorded from a tornado in 1991. This, this would be broken in 1999 by a very, very specific tornado that I hope I don't need to mention. And of course, as a caveat to this, is that this wind speed was not measured at the ground level. This was measured, I think it was around clo much closer to the cloud base. We're talking around 105 feet up. So not at the cloud base and not at the ground either. But wind speeds of a tornado do decrease as you go down the funnel because of friction. So this 260 miles per hour was likely lower at ground level. The next tornado here, the Turleton to Skiatook, some interesting names there, Oklahoma, Oklahoma F4 and some aftermath photos seen here at the top right and bottom left. This tornado would injure 24 people and did kill one person. This tornado coursed a slightly higher than average, almost 52 kilometers, 51.9. As is the case with most tornadoes, this rapidly progressed to a wedge and stayed as a wedge near its entire life. Again, I've said this before, most tornadoes achieve their rating and also achieve their width very quickly and then stay that for their entire life until they rope out and die. Aside from that, this tornado would directly hit the airport along its track. I forget what town it was, though I do want to say it was Turleton. And this thing would toss two separate airplanes into trees. And we're, we're not talking about some 1930s airplanes. This is 1991. So definitely not light. Besides that, besides two airplanes being tossed, hundreds of buildings and cars would be destroyed. And even a 3,000 pound boat was tossed half a mile which is 0.8 kilometers. 
Thankfully, I was able to find a picture of the tornado. However, it's grainy because, of course, it's a newspaper photo. But still happy that I found it. Here is the main star of the show and the tornado that this outbreak gets its name from. The Hayesville to El Dorado, Kansas F5 or the Andover F5, as it is very commonly known as. This tornado would kill 17 people, accounting for, what is that, 90% of the death toll from this outbreak, and wreaked 74.6 kilometers of destruction. This tornado ranged quite wildly in width, from one-fourth of a mile when it first touched down to three fourths of a mile when it when it hit Andover. The track of the tornado obviously is seen here at the top right, an aftermath photo seen here in the middle, and progressive from left to right, from the earliest time to the latest time, is seen here at the bottom. And here's a little time scale of what happened. The NWS had issued alerts for Hayesville as well as as well as other towns by eight oh five or eighteen sorry by six oh five or eighteen oh five. This was likely a severe thunderstorm warning at first, and then probably then became a tornado warning along with that severe thunderstorm warning. This tornado would hit McConnell Air Force Base at this is supposed to say 18.04, but, I was, but it's 6.24, so I wrote 16.24. Again, in 24-hour clock, the 16 is supposed to be an 18, but it, this, it would hit the Air Force Base at 6.24. And a picture of it actually hitting the Air Force Base is seen here at the second picture. And circled here in pink are B-1 bombers and purportedly two of which had nuclear warheads at the time, which I cannot confirm. What I can confirm is that this tornado did not hit any of them, which is thankful. And at 6.31, the tornado... Sorry, no, at 6.31, Andover police were warning... Golden Spur Mobile Park, located here, as you can see, which is in Andover, of the tornado by megaphone. The reason they were doing this was because the tornado siren's electrical system had failed, so they were unable to start. So the police did what they could, and thankfully, they were able to give them a 12-minute lead time, which is relatively impressive. Considering that even now, the average time for a tornado warning is only 10 minutes, 10 to 15. And as you can, and as I said, the 12 minute warn time at 631, 12 minutes later, the tornado would strike Andover. This tornado is, is also a myth creator. I'll go into detail a little later. And what would actually be the last F5 in Kansas until 2007. So 16 years, 1991 to 2007, if my maths is right. I'm not good at on-the-spot maths. I'm not good at maths in general, so, you know. But this third image here in the sequence is the tornado hitting Andover. And this fourth image with the tornado highlighted in green, in between the green lines, is the tornado narrowly missing an overpass, which should give you an idea about the myth that it created. The last one here chronologically is the Arkansas City to Cambridge, Kansas F4. I wish I could get this photo without all this text on here because it gives you all the information you need. And I want to write it myself, but no, thank, but thanks NWS for this picture. As you can see with his wedge, that tracked 40 and a half kilometers, which is 25 miles. 
This tornado would kill one person and injure zero and caused in 1991 US dollars five, around $5 million and f adjusted for inflation it's around $25 million. As you can see here along with, with this picture it was had a width of three-fourths of miles wide which is 1.2 kilometers wide. The significance of this outbreak mainly comes from the star of the show, the Andover F5. Other than that, this event was just a classic setup at a classic time at a classic location. This is your classic cold front dry line event and dead in the heart of Tornado Alley in April. That's classic. There's no other way to put it. That's just how outbreaks work. That's just how they are. That's This is like perfectly average outbreak almost. Except for the fact that the Andover F5 created a huge and hazardous tornado safety myth. That being that you can hide from a tornado and survive from Sorry, by hiding under a highway overpass. Now, I wouldn't be talking about this if it wasn't a myth, but it is. Because the... Go back here. This photo from a video that was taken, this screenshot that I took from, an, from a video, is from a film crew that managed to narrowly escape the tornado by jumping out of their car near an overpass and then hiding under the overpass. And the reason why they didn't die was because the tornado didn't directly hit the overpass. Now, here's a little thing that you have to realize. Overpasses creates a smaller than average gap with all of the air around it. And when you squeeze air into a space that's even smaller than it was before, it acts exactly like water. It's going to speed up. Because the particles and everything, because particles of the molecules have the space to compress. Water has that same property as well. So it speeds up when it enters a funnel. You are funneling the air underneath the overpass and causing it to go faster. That's even worse than if you just got into your basement, which is protected from the winds entirely because it's underground. And we'll see this safety myth come up again in the May outbreak of 1999 with a certain F5 that killed one person each at three separate overpasses. So, yeah. But aside from that myth, and again, the tracks of the tornado seen here for a point is that there are around five multi-tornado supercells, and those easily accounted for a majority of the tornadoes that occurred. One of those tornadoes the Andover F5. It's actually right here. If you can see my cursor, if you see my mouse pointer, the, the laser pointer, there you go. It's right in the middle of a supercell track. But that is it that I have for y'all. I don't have anything else. And thank you so much for seeing it to the end of this video. I'll see you guys in the next one.